Hello, and welcome to First Chapter Friday. Today, I'm going to be reading from The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise by Dan Gemeinhart. Be impressed that I can say that last name. I looked up how he says it so I wouldn't mess it up. It's Gemeinhart. And he's written lots of wonderful books, and Coyote Sunrise is the newest. Uh, We actually got it in our library last spring, and I've been drawn to it because it has a beautiful cover. I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but, you know, a nice cover never hurts. But it never stays checked in long enough for me to read it. And then, lo and behold, it has shown up on the 2020 Lone Star list. So I have snagged my copy, and I'm taking it home over the winter break to read it myself. Um, But everything I've heard, it is a beautiful story. So it follows Coyote and her dad, Rodeo who have been traveling around the country on an old school bus for the last five years, which is when Coyote's mom and sister died in a bad car wreck. Um, And she's kind of been happy to go along with her dad, and then she finds out that the park in their old neighborhood is about to be demolished, which uh, she and her mom and her sisters had buried a memory box there. So she has to figure out how to get her dad back to her hometown so she can get her memory box without actually telling him where they're going and they pick up all these crazy characters along the way so i hope you enjoy it i said you can always go procure your own copy at um, a bookstore or at the local library the public library but we also have several copies here in our thornton library so here we go chapter one There were big days and there were small days and there were bad days and there were good days. And I suppose I could pick any one of them for my once upon a time. But if I'm going to be truthful and truthful is something I always aim to be, then there really is only one best place to start this story. It all started with Ivan. Once upon a time, it was hot and I was sweaty. It was about five months before my 13th birthday, give or take. We were someplace in Oregon. Honestly, I don't even remember the name of the town, but I know it was on the dry, hot side of the state, away from the ocean. The whole world was so yellow and shining from the beating down sun that you had to squint no matter where you looked. The blacktop of the gas station parking lot radiated the heat right back up at you, so it felt like you were getting cooked from both sides. I suppose most barefoot people would have been hooting and hopping, with that sizzling asphalt burning the bottoms of their feet, but my soles were so used to it, and I walked along easy as you please. My t-shirt was stuck with sweat to my back. The braid that hung down nearly to my blue jean belt loop slapped wetly against it as I walked. The man behind the counter looked at my bare feet and started to say something. Miss, you can't! But I knew where he was going with it before he started. That tyrannical no shoes, no shirt, no service rule pretty darn universal in America's gas station convenience stores. I just waved at him and cut him off. I know, I know, I said and kept walking. I'll only be a minute. I'd never been in that particular gas station before, but it was exactly the same as every other one, so really I'd been in it a million times. Rows of plastic wrapped junk food, walls lined with glass doored coolers full of pop and beer and flavored iced teas. I walked past the metal racks of beef jerky and candy bars to the pot of gold at the end of my rainbow. The slushy machine. There it was, humming in the corner next to the coffee dispenser and soda fountain. My mouth started watering as soon as I saw that neon-colored sugar slush swirling around under the big plastic dome. There was a kid standing in front of it, looking up at the churning slurry with a desire written plain and clear across his face. He was seven or eight and staring up at the left flavor, which was an unlikely pinkish color labeled wild watermelon. Big mistake, I said, walking up next to him, grabbing a cut from the pull-down dispenser. He jerked his head to look at me. What is? I nodded with my chin at the slushy he was coveting. Watermelon, that's a no-go. Never waste your time with anything that claims to be watermelon or banana flavored. It's a scam every time. He squinted at me, clearly unconvinced. Doesn't matter anyway, he said. My mom already said no. He threw his head back dramatically. 
But I'm so hot. I yanked down another cup and held it out to him. Here, I said, my treat. The kid's face lit up. For reals? He asked. Yep. Then his face dropped again just as quick. But mom said no, I'll probably get in trouble. I shrugged. You're probably going to get in trouble at some point today anyway. You may as well get a slushy out of it. He thought about that for a real short second and then snatched the cup from my hand. But I really would think twice about getting watermelon, I added. My advice fell on deaf ears, and in a flash, he was pulling down the knob and squirting glistening pink slush into his cup. I filled mine with the other flavor, funky fruit punch, which was the superior choice in every respect. The kid looked me up and down as we walked toward the cashier. You're wearing weird clothes. I looked down at my raggedy blue jeans and grease-stained white t-shirt. I'm basically wearing the same thing you're wearing, I pointed out. Exactly, he said, and I'm a boy. So? So boys and girls shouldn't wear the same thing. <laughs> well, then you better change, because I ain't. He had nothing to say to that, which was probably the right move on his part, since I hadn't yet paid for his slushie. I ignored the hostile, good riddance look on the cashier's face when I paid. Like hot asphalt on bare feet, it was something I was used to. Me and the kid walked through the jangling door and back out into the heat. The highway hummed not too far off in the distance. The kid took a big slurping suck on his slushy straw. He swallowed and smacked his lips and nodded. Well, I asked, how's the wild watermelon? He ran his tongue over his lips, considering. Sweet, he said. Weird. Not really like watermelon at all. I nodded and took a suck of my delicious, flavored as advertised, funky fruit punch. Lesson learned, kid. Now you know. He looked glum uh, glumly at the phosphorescent pinkness in his cup. I sighed. It's tough seeing a kid get a bad break. I held mine out to him. Here, I said trade. His eyebrows shot high. Reels? Sure. I don't mind it all that much, I lied. And you're the one who's getting in trouble. Better make it worth it. We swapped slushies and I took a sip of wild watermelon. He watched for my reaction. I think, I said, that the flavor designer at the slushy company needs to spend a little more time eating watermelon. The kid nodded. I tapped my slushy cup against his. Cheers, kid. Enjoy. He said, thanks. And I said, you're welcome. And then he said, you want a kitten? And I swallowed a mouthful of syrupy slush and licked my lips and wiped a bit of juice off my chin with my arm and said, what? You want a kitten? He repeated. He pointed to where an older boy sat on the curb next to a big cardboard box. We're giving him away. Want one? I looked out at the big, beat-up yellow school bus parked next to one of the gas pumps. There was no way I'd be allowed to get a cat. It was a no-go for sure. I sighed. Well, I said, let's go take a look at least. There were five kittens in that cardboard box, and when I leaned over to look in, they all looked up at me with big, round eyes and triangle ears, and I tell you, I was smitten. Who are you? The older kid asked, and the younger one said, she bought me a slushie. And the older kid held out his hand, and the younger one handed it over. The older kid took a slurp and smacked his lips and nodded and handed it back. You want a kitten? He asked. They were as brothers as brothers can be, those two. I eyed the bus again and cocked an eyebrow. He was nowhere to be seen. Well, I guess I don't know yet. It's complicated. Both boys nodded. They had parents. They knew how it was. Go ahead and pick one up, the older boy said. Take it for a spin. I pursed my lips. They were awfully cute, those tiny things with their wispy tails and whiskers. I thought about how I could get away with it. The kittens mewed up at me, squealing in scratchy little squeaks. That could be a problem. Which one's the quietest one? Without a moment's pause, both kids pointed out the smallest one, a gray and white striped puff of fur off by itself a little ways in a corner of the box. Someone's wrong with that one, the younger kid said. The other one's never shut up, but that one hasn't made a peep since it was born. Really? I said and narrowed my eyes in approval. She sounds just about right then. It's a boy. It is? Check for yourself. <laughs> no thanks, I'll take your word for it. I crouched there, looking at that little silent white and gray furball. He looked back at me. He had a very serious look about me. Solemn even. Like maybe he had it backward, 
And what he thought was happening was him deciding whether or not to pick me. He was not a kitten to be trifled with. I set my slushie on the curb and reached in and cradled that little thing in my hand as gentle as I could. A hush fell over my whole self when I felt that trembling soul in my big clumsy hand. He was all fragile feeling bones and feathery fur and racing frantic heartbeats. I held him right up to my face. He looked back at me, his eyes huge and ears forward, but he didn't make a sound. He didn't meow, didn't growl, didn't squeak, didn't wiggle. We looked deep into each other's eyes, me and that kitten. My heart got a little bigger with each beat. I tell you, something changed when that kitten and I looked at each other. Something big. Either something in the universe that had been sitting still for too long started moving again, or something that was moving finally fell still. Either way, it was something. You see, I'd walked into that gas station alone, and I'd walked out of it alone, just like I'd walked into and out of gas stations alone every day for, like, years. And maybe, right then and there, holding that kitten is when I'd just had enough of all that aloneness. It was a quiet moment, and maybe one that anyone watching from outside my heart wouldn't even have noticed. But I tell you, it was a big moment all the same. The kitten yawned, a jaw gaping yawn that showed off his sharp needle teeth and scaly gray tongue and a decent percentage of his throat. Yeah, I whispered, you're the one, ain't ya? So you want him? Yeah, I answered through a little smile that was just growing on my face. Yeah, I want him. And it was about the truest thing I ever said. Now, I knew I'd never get permission to keep the warm little ball of perfection I was holding in my hands. It was a no without a doubt, and I knew it. I knew he wouldn't be happy when he found out. But I also knew that the one thing he was always saying was, wherever your heart wants to go, go there and don't look back. And where my heart wanted to go was definitely looking back at me with eyes that were bluer than a blue raspberry slushy. Who's that weirdo? The younger kid asked his brother, and even though I was still stuck in a love at first yawn eye lock with the kitten, I didn't have to look to know who they were talking about. I glanced over my shoulder anyway, because now I had a contraband kitten to keep concealed. There he was in all his glory, brown jeans with more hold than jean, no shirt, no shoes. There is no doubt he would get no service. Skinny, with bony shoulders and ribs poking out all over the place. Long, shaggy hair pulled back with a bandana. A big, bushy beard that hung down almost to his collarbones. He was scraping all of the bug corpses off the bus's windshield with that little squeegee on a stick that comes at gas stations keep by the pumps. And he was half dancing and whistling while he did it. He looked totally funky fruit punch, which he was, so, again, flavored as advertised. That, I answered, lowering the kitten to my belly to keep him out of sight, is rodeo. Both kids squinted up at me. He's my dad, I added. That dude's your dad? Yep. I lowered my face and my voice and whispered, but don't tell him that, okay? Both boys nodded with their serious, syrup stand faces. They were the kind you could trust, those brothers. I looked back at the bus, that kitten pressed up against my t-shirt. Rodeo was doing his cleaning shuffle all around the front of the bus. If I was going to make this kitten in my hand a kitten in my bus, I was going to need help. I looked at the little kid who was sucking hard at his slushy and still eyeballing Rodeo. Could you do me a solid, kid? He scrunched up his eyebrows at me. A favor, I explained, and he nodded. You see those back windows on the bus with the curtains that got stars on them? Yeah. That's my room. I need you. That's your room? Like your room room? Sure. You live on that bus? Yeah. So? I never knew no one who lived on an old school bus. Well, you can't say that anymore, can you? I handed the kitten over to him, gentle as could be. Here's the deal. Ain't no way Rodeo's going to say yes to this kitten. Yet, anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and get in and go on to my room. Meet me with the kitten at my window on the other side in like a minute, okay? The kid looked at his brother, and his brother shrugged and nodded. The kid looked back at me. So me and you both gonna get in trouble today, huh? I grinned at him. Guess so.
But heck, if kittens and slushies aren't worth getting in trouble for, what the world is? I grabbed my sunglasses from where they were hanging off my t-shirt collar. They were big, huge, round brown things with thick plastic frames. One dollar at a New Mexico flea market and worth every penny. I slid them on, turning the lights down on the world. You ready? Sure. I sauntered up to the bus, sipping at my watermelon slushie, like I didn't have a care in the world. Rodeo looked over at me when I swung open the accordion door. He was scraping at a grass ha uh, grasshopper leg with his thumbnail, his tongue out in concentration. No bananas, he asked. No, sir, I said with a little salute, though to be truthful, I hadn't remembered to look. Well, shoot, Rodeo said, and then flashed me that toothy smile that I could never help but smile back at. On to the next stop, then. I shot him a hand pistol and climbed up the stairs into the bus, all casual and slow. I walked past the rows of seats in Rodeo's little bed, and then on through our living room, past the bookshelves bolted to the wall and the couch bolted to the floor and the garden of plants growing in planters bolted under a window. Through the windows, I saw the kid was walking toward the back of the bus. His hand covered a little lump under his shirt. His walk was easy and smooth as my own. He didn't even look in Rodeo's direction. He was a natural, that kid. I pushed through the curtains into my room. It was hot and stuffy back there, but once we got rolling, it had cooled down. I went straight to the window and pulled the curtain to the side. There was the kid looking up at me with his mouth open and his hands full of kitten. I pinched the latches with both hands and slid the window down with as quiet a thunk as I could manage. The kid reached up and held the kitten high. It hung limp in his hand. Huh, I said. Even with me leaning out the window, the kitten was still a couple feet below my hand. Hold on a sec. I ducked back inside and looked around. I pulled my old straw cowboy hat off the hook on the wall and shook my jacket off a wire hanger and then flattened the hanger out straight. The hat had a long braided chin strap and I hooked the hanger through it and lowered the whole thing out the window. Go ahead and put him in the hat, I hissed, and the kid did. Careful as I could, I pulled the hat up, kitten and all. In a jiffy, I had that kitten in my hands. He looked up at me as content as can be like riding a cowboy hat elevator up to a school bus was just part of his daily routine. I was liking that cat more and more every second, and I liked him a whole heck of a lot to begin with. I stuck my head back out the window. Thanks for the slushy, the kid said. You're welcome. Thanks for the kitten. The kid shrugged, which I thought was appropriate. I heard the bus door squeak and shutter closed. A second later, that big old diesel engine fired up and shook my room with its rumble. The kid took a step back. Well, see ya, kid, I said. See ya, he said and walked away around the back of the bus. There was a big box of books by my bed and I tipped it over, dumping the books onto the floor. I set the box between my bolted-in shelf and my bolted-in bedside table and set the kitten down inside. He looked awful small and lonely in there. So I folded up an old t-shirt and stuck that and a little stuffed dinosaur in there with him. He sniffed the dinosaur, looked up at me, and then laid down with the little plop. I looked at the pile of books on the floor next to the box, and the shiny gold title of my favorite one caught my eye, the one and only Ivan. It was a sign for sure. Perfect, I said. I reached down and scratched the kitten's head with one fingernail. He closed his eyes, leaning into it. Ivan, I whispered. That's your name, Ivan whether you like it or not, but I hope you like it. Ivan sure didn't look like he minded it. Now, I gotta make sure Rodeo doesn't get suspicious, I said. Stay put. Rodeo had gotten up to the driver's seat by then. He slid his own sunglasses on and tossed a handful of sunflower seeds into his mouth. Shells and all. I knelt on the seat behind him and leaned over his shoulder. Ready to roll, coyote? He asked me. Ready as rain, I answered with a grin. Where are we going? He disengaged the parking brake and flicked on the radio. Freaky hippie electric guitar wailed out of the speakers. Only one way to find out, he said. He slapped the dusty dashboard of the bus and shouted, You ready, Yair? He gunned the gas pedal, making the old bus engine roar. And then he, plopped, he popped the clutch and we started forward with a jerk. His head bobbed to the music and his lips pursed as he worked on the 
on tonguing those seeds out of their shells. Give me a howl, coyote, he hollered through his mouth full of seeds. I threw my head back and howled a high and happy coyote wail that echoed off the riveted metal roof. Ow, ow, ow. I hoped Ivan would hear me and know I was still there. And I hoped like heck he kept his mouth shut and didn't try to howl back. All the front windows were open and the air started moving around, fluttering the pages of books and cooling us down. I lowered my head and saw the two kids out the window, sitting on the curb next to a box that was one kitten short. They were both looking at me with curious wrinkles on their forehead. The little one was back to sucking on his, my, funky fruit punch slushy. I shrugged at them, the most fitting gesture, I thought, and threw them a big wave. They waved back in unison. Good kids, those two. The kind of kids you almost wouldn't mind seeing again. We pulled out into the highway, and the engine growled as it struggled to, up to speed. The black ribbon of road stretched out forever before us, just like it always did. I took a sip of my slushy and nodded my head along with the rodeos to the beat of the music. I had a kitten, which definitely meant I had a problem. But heck, I already had problems, and now I also had Ivan. And that sure seemed like an improvement either way. So I hope you liked the first chapter of The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise. Happy reading! <laughs>